we have a serial killer. We have a killer in our, you know, community walking around free today. This morning, new information in the manhunt for a serial killer whose trail of terror has led police to a beach in New York's Long Island. Police just released sketches of two people whose remains were found along Ocean Parkway. Three more bodies. Four unidentified bodies. Eight bodies. Ten sets of human remains have been found. Police say none of the bodies is that of Shannon Gilbert, the prostitute whose disappearance sparked the initial search. My sister went missing July 9, 2007. She was from Norwich, Connecticut. Uh, she went to New York and she never came home. Megan Waterman was my daughter. She lived in Scavo. She went missing June 6th of 2010. These 11 bodies or fragments of, of human remains were found in search of a missing woman, Shannon Gilbert. They were human beings. They didn't deserve to die. Hello, I'm Richard French, and welcome to our special report, Bodies at the Beach, a search for a serial killer. Now, they've often lived among us. We know of Jack the Ripper, the Boston Strangler, Ted Bundy, John Wayne Gacy, Jeffrey Dahmer, and of course, the son of Sam, whose reign of terror, coincidentally, claiming six lives in and around New York City, ended 35 years ago this month. Now, although they lived in different times and may have had different motivations for their crimes, they were all serial killers who preyed on the innocent. Well, today, many believe the same type of serial killer, perhaps even more than one, is on the loose in Suffolk County, Long Island. Now, the case began with the disappearance of a 24-year-old young lady named Shannon Gilbert in May of 2010. Now, she traveled from New Jersey to Oak Beach on Long Island, where, as a prostitute, she went to meet a client. While there, she made what has been described by some as a frantic call to 911. Soon afterwards, she disappeared. To this day, no one knows why. But it was that search for Gilbert which led to one gruesome discovery after another as more bodies and body parts kept turning up. In fact, the search for Gilbert led to the discovery that Ocean Parkway, including the well-known Gilgo Beach area along the Atlantic Ocean, was nothing less than a dumping ground for bodies as multiple sets of human remains were found. All the cases remain unsolved. Now, over the course of the next 60 minutes, we will take an in-depth look at the gruesome and grisly findings so far in this baffling murder mystery. Now, it's a story filled with sudden twists and too often just dead ends. It's also a story of emotional and devastated families who want to know how and why their loved ones died. Holly Hare reports in Bodies at the Beach, Search, for a serial killer. It's a beautiful stretch of beach, miles of sand and water along the Atlantic Ocean, south of New York's Long Island. But now the barrier island that connects Jones Beach State Park and Oak Beach is sinister to some since 11 sets of human remains have been found there and the search is underway for at least one serial killer, maybe more. Yeah. The chilling mystery began to unfold on May 1st, 2010, when 24-year-old Shannon Gilbert disappeared. She lived in Jersey City and made a living as a prostitute, but her mother Mary Gilbert and sister Stevie Smith remember her as much more than that, a loving daughter, sister, and aunt. My favorite memory of Shannon's is that she loved to cook. She was a really, really good cook. She was very joyful, you know, nothing brought her down. Shannon grew up in the small town of Ellenville, New York, one of four sisters. She used to help Stevie with her homework and graduated from high school at the age of 16. She was very, very, very book smart too as well. And um, her, her goal was to be a writer. Mary cherishes a card Shannon gave her after Mary received a promotion at work. The words of a daughter who loved her mother. I look on to you for strength in times of my own struggles to realize anything is possible. On May 1st, 2010, a call from a potential client, Joseph Brewer, brought Shannon to the Homeowners Association here in Oak Beach. Her family says the money Shannon was being offered was more than she normally made, and the rent was due. I believe quite possibly she was drugged. 
that maybe she was slipped something, that she was given something to drink or to maybe eat. She, she knew she wasn't feeling right, that she possibly knew something was wrong. Shannon ran off at one point, knocking on Gus Coletti's front door in a panic. At another point, knocking on another homeowner association resident, Barbara Brennan's door, and running off again. Mary and Stevie say police mishandled Shannon's disappearance from the start. If she had enough strength and knowledge to call the police, to scream for help, to run as far and as long as she did. At one point, she dialed 911. Mary can't understand why police couldn't find her. Cell phones have a GPS. They could have found her, and they could have found her in time. But police say Shannon wasn't able to give them information they could use, for example, saying she was near Jones Beach, several miles away. We know she called uh, that morning, 911. She was on the phone for 20 minutes. We have that. We listened to it. What we heard was someone who seemed disoriented, confused. She did not seem rational. Besides Shannon, Coletti and Brennan called 911 that day. After Mr. Coletti called, uh, our patrol units were on the scene within 18 minutes, but actually within 10 minutes after Ms. As Brennan called. So we had police on the scene. The big mystery was what happened to her. I believe they didn't take the matter serious because of her profession. Shannon's disappearance remained unsolved, so Mary Gilbert investigated on her own, visiting Oak Beach and looking through her daughter's records. As Mary and her family waited for news of Shannon's whereabouts, there was a major development. In December 2010, a police dog and handler looking for Shannon found human remains along Ocean Parkway, which leads to Oak Beach, not far from where Shannon was last seen. But it was not what anyone was expecting. December 11th, 2010, which was a Saturday, uh, the cadaver dog across the highway from Oak Beach uh, came upon, upon the remains uh, of a body. At that time, everybody assumed, when I got the call from the chief of detectives, it was assumed that it was Shannon Gilbert. Richard Dormer was Suffolk County's police commissioner at the time. In an exclusive interview with Fios One News, he recalled getting the news that Officer John Malia and his canine found remains. Then, Dormer got the news that the remains belonged to someone else. They determined it wasn't Shannon Gilbert because she had uh, a titanium plate in her jaw. And this remains that were found did not have that. Two days later, they made even more grim discoveries. Former Commissioner Dormer told us what it was like as the investigation unfolded. This was a shock. I mean, uh, one body uh, was disturbing enough. But then on that Monday, when I got the call from the chief of detectives, we found another remains. And sometime later, he calls and says, we found more remains. In January 2011, police announced they had identified the remains, all women. Maureen Brainerd Barnes, last seen in New York City in July 2007. Melissa Bartholomew, who went missing from the Bronx in July 2009. Megan Waterman, who disappeared June 2010 from Hopog. And Amberlyn Costello, last seen in North Babylon in September 2010. Our investigation indicates that each of the victims had been posting ads on computer websites for various escort and other services prior to their disappearance and death. Is this a serial killer? I believe it is, yes. Megan Waterman's mom, Lorraine Ila, remembers when she first learned her daughter was missing. When me and my mom got the call at 7 o'clock on June 6th that my daughter was missing, I knew deep down inside that they were not going to find her alive. I just knew it. Um, I've told a lot of people that, but I also had to keep that little bit of hope that they would have found her alive. And then she got the call in December 2010 that remains had been found. I didn't want to believe that it was my daughter. I just didn't want to. I still had that little bit of hope. Um, and then two days later, we got a call that they found three more bodies, and I, I just knew. Megan was a wonderful mom, a wonderful daughter. Um, anybody that met Megan fell in love with Megan. 
her smile, you could be so depressed, so upset, crying, but you look at Megan and when she's smiling and your whole appearance changes. Melissa Can received a similar call about her sister, Maureen Brainerd Barnes. It's hard, it gets harder every day. It doesn't, um, they say that time uh, heals all wounds and that's not true, it gets worse. You just get used to them not being there, but you experience more memories without them there. She told us about Maureen's life prior to her disappearance. My sister, at the time that she went missing, she was uh, struggling to find a job. There was so much more to my sister than just why the reason why she was in New York in the first place. She was bubbly, you know, alive, full of, you know, spirit. She wrote poetry. She was loving. Throughout the tragedy, Lorraine and Melissa have given each other emotional support. They say it's their lost loved ones who have brought them together. We were all have the same goal in mind, which is justice, and we're all together for to support each other. Maureen was here and Megan was right here. They were this close to each other. So I think they're the ones that brought me and Melissa together as close as we are because they were found so close together. In the spring of 2011, investigators made even more disturbing discoveries. I think no one was more surprised than the police to continue finding human remains. The more they searched, the more they found. The search for a missing escort from New Jersey turned up four sets of human remains along isolated Ocean Parkway in Suffolk County in December 2010, and officials started talking about a serial killer. Winter weather conditions forced the search to stop for several months. In the spring of 2011, the effort resumed, and along with milder temperatures came more shocking news. You know, we were still looking for Shannon Gilbert, and the thought was that she was out there someplace. And um, we also were concerned that there were more remains out there. And so I sat with the task force, with the chief of detectives, and we decided that we were going to go back in there with a very comprehensive, detailed search. Using fire trucks, canines, and manpower, police searched through miles of thick brush. They combed the beach, and divers searched the water along the north side of the barrier island and by homes in the Oak Beach Homeowners Association. Former Police Commissioner Dormer says the discoveries kept coming. Very soon into the search, March 29th, a uh, canine officer found the remains. So now we have five remains. The search continues, and on April 4th, three more bodies were found, or remains were found. Now it's eight. I mean, this is getting bigger by the month. In April 2011, the search expanded to Nassau County, and county and state police made two discoveries in one day in the areas by Jones Beach. At approximately 11.20 uh, a.m., a uh, state trooper using a cadaver dog uh, did locate some bones. And Tobey Beach. At around 3.30, officers discovered about 96 feet north off the parkway, all right, what appears to be a human, appears to be a human skull. In all, a total of 10 sets of human remains had been found along Ocean Parkway. And to really uh, throw a monkey wrench into the investigation, the anthropologist from New York City, the medical examiner, through our medical examiner, came back and said that there was a toddler, was one of the four, and an Asian male. <clears throat> now, we were dealing with females before that, the remains of young females. And so now we had to change gears. We're thinking, uh, you know, there are more than one killer. Uh, is there something else going on here? Uh, is this a dumping ground? for different killers. The area in and around Gilgo Beach has been used to discard human remains for some period of time. In May 2011, authorities revealed that the beach area was linked to another dumping ground in Suffolk County, about 40 miles away in Manorville. The partial remains of Jessica Taylor had been discovered in Manorville in 2003. The district attorney announced searchers on Ocean Parkway found the rest. Ms. Taylor's remains were missing her head hands, and forearm. The remains that we found on March 29, 2011 
are the remains, the head, hands, and forearm of Miss Taylor. Authorities say she also worked as a prostitute. A sixth person known as Jane Doe number six also had partial remains found in Manorville and at the beach. In September 2011, Suffolk police released a sketch of what she may have looked like in an effort to figure out who she was. Despite our best efforts, we have still been unable to identify Jane Doe number six. Police have also had a difficult time identifying the remaining victims, including a female toddler and a woman who's believed to be her mother. Both wore jewelry, an Asian male who police say was wearing women clothes, and a woman whose partial remains were also found off Fire Island in the 90s. A retired detective called the Homicide Squad and said, in 1996, I handled uh, a case where two legs were in a bag, women's legs, off Davis Park, off Fire Island. Check out the DNA, see if it's connected to your case, and it did. Zhang Shiwa is a forensic pathologist and Union County, New Jersey medical examiner. He's not working directly on the Gilgo cases, but has handled many murders. The main thing is try to get the body identified. If you identify body, certainly you can retroactively, going backwards, talk to the family, when was last missing, last seen alive, the circle of friend, and it can, it can trace down lots of additional information. Wa says that although the remains found along Ocean Parkway may have been there for a long period of time, DNA testing is still possible. Cut inside the bone marrow is a good source of DNA. Dr. Wa adds it's not like TV crime shows with quick solutions, and he says the job is especially hard if the person was never reported missing in the first place. If you're missing, no one really reports you're missing, so it's certainly become a dead end. As investigators continued to work to identify the remains, police made another grim discovery. The person they had originally been looking for, Shannon Gilbert, was found. And rather than provide answers, the list of questions grew even longer. The Suffolk County Police Department's search for a missing escort from New Jersey turned up 10 sets of human remains along Ocean Parkway, leading some to call it a dumping ground for bodies. Finally, in December 2011, Suffolk police brought in heavy machinery to search through a swampy area near the Oak Beach Homeowners Association, the place where 24-year-old Shannon Gilbert was last seen alive. We went in with the idea that we were going to do this one last time to see if we could find anything, and we did. Canine officer John Malia discovered items which included a pocketbook with identification in the pocketbook belonging to Shannon Gilbert. Today, during the search, they found a cell phone, which they believe may belong to Shannon Gilbert. Then, on December 13, 2011, exactly one year after the remains of three other women were found, the search for Shannon Gilbert was over. We have this day, at approximately 9.14 a.m., located a set of skeletal remains we believe at this time to belong to the missing Shannon Gilbert. After a year and a half of searching for answers, Shannon's mother found the news hard to believe. Until I heard positive confirmation that it is my daughter, I'm going to believe it's not until I know for sure. Officials positively identified the remains as Shannon Gilbert, but there was something else that was even harder for Mary Gilbert and many others to believe as police described the marshy area and the theory that she died after getting stuck in the marsh. We've had officers abruptly drop to their waist or deeper in that muck, essentially like quicksand, and they've been unable to extricate themselves without the assistance of fellow officers. She traveled at least a half a mile uh, three quarters of a mile on foot through that, through that muck, mud, brambles, thick area and it would be very easy to get exhausted and fall down and not be able to move any further. We took a walk with Dormer in the area two years after Gilbert disappeared. You can see the terrain here, how thick it is, how difficult it would be for to make your way through in the darkness. Uh, this area that we're standing in right now has been cut down, so we could make uh, an entrance to the crime scene. But May 1st, two years ago, it was thick like this. It was uh, rough, atrocious terrain. Uh, this young lady, uh, you know, disoriented, 
uh, trying to make our way through this marshy area uh, would become, uh, you know, overcome by the elements. Uh, this is our theory. But Mary Gilbert and others don't accept that theory. She has visited the spot where her daughter was found. Well, when I was there, um, and I physically walked to where her remains were found in the marsh, there is no way she ran where her body was found. It was lodged on the left side of a tree, a very large tree that they had to cut down, which means that her body flowed and stopped at that tree. The Gilbert family hired a lawyer and asked the FBI to investigate. They wonder why police haven't done more, like look at Shannon's client records, records the family still has. They're also suspicious of Shannon's driver, Michael Pack, her client, Joseph Brewer, and his neighbor, Dr. Hackett. I strongly believe there is someone in the police department, in the justice system, that is stopping A from B to connect to C. I strongly believe. I think they're more concerned about the threat and the fear the public is facing with the serial killer than one individual that may be separate from being a part of the serial killer case and looking to see what happened to her. In May of 2012, the Gilberts heard from the medical examiner, but the results only raised more questions for them. I was optimistic when I first walked in, but now I'm more frustrated and angry than ever. The tests render their conclusion inconclusive. They cannot conclude uh, at all as to how this woman died. The Gilbert's lawyer, John Ray, says at that meeting, the medical examiner talked about Shannon's 911 call. Files One News has requested the tape under the Freedom of Information Act. So far, investigators have not released it. In a letter in Newsday, a detective who worked on the case said Shannon's demeanor was calm during the call and male voices heard on the tape were calm. But Ray says that's not what he was told. When we talked to the ME, she says exactly the opposite of what that police officer wrote and published in a public newspaper. And she claims that you can hear Shannon screaming, you can hear a scuffle that takes place, a lengthy scuffle lasting several minutes. Um, you can hear her, Shannon, saying that th they're plotting to kill me. He also says police haven't done enough to look into certain people. The initial suspects would have been the, the John, who was Brewer, um, the driver, who was Mr. Pack, and the doctor who's told a series of contradictory stories. That would be Dr. Hackett. Hackett, according to Mary, calls Mary. And in the first conversation, he tells Mary uh, that he has Shannon and that she's safe and that uh, he has established a home for wayward girls. In the second call, Ray says Hackett apparently tells Mary that Shannon has run away. Commissioner Dormer insists investigators have looked at all the angles. Brewer was very cooperative with the police. He allowed us to search his home, uh, search his vehicle, and um, he was very upfront about, uh, you know, the issue that he had uh, reached out to her on Craigslist, uh, made arrangements for her to come to Oak Beach. Dr. Hackett was also investigated by our uh, detectives. Uh, when they were investigating the missing persons uh, report. The driver that drove her out to Long Island from the city, he was vetted, he was thoroughly investigated. And um, there was no reason to believe that any of them were involved in her disappearance. The situation with Shannon Gilbert, it seems completely counterintuitive that she could have died accidentally. Dr. Casey Jordan, a criminologist and professor at Western Connecticut State University, has been following the Gilgo case closely. In reviewing the evidence from that particular body recovery site and in speaking with the police, I am convinced that uh, she suffered some kind of panic episode and did run into the marsh, probably got bogged down, lost her purse, her shoes, continued to try to get out, and eventually succumbed to the elements. Anything is possible in these sorts of cases, and I think that Shannon's family is wise to keep the questions alive because the circumstances of her death are very suspicious. And the questions continue to be asked, not only about Gilbert's case, but about the other 10 victims found along Ocean Parkway and about how many killers might be responsible.
We study in criminology these cases all the time, and we have never seen anything quite like this. As police investigated the bodies on the beach, a public disagreement erupted between the district attorney and police commissioner over how many killers there may be. There's a murderer out there. And we think it's one person. In November 2011, then Police Commissioner Richard Dormer told Fios One News he thought one killer was responsible for the 10 sets of remains found along Ocean Parkway. But current Suffolk County DA Thomas Spoda publicly disputed that theory, and others also question it. If it's only one killer, they defy everything that we know in profiles of serial killers. Uh, the idea that some of the bodies appear to be dismembered, some of them are intact. Criminologist Dr. Casey Jordan has studied the Gilgo case and says victims who were dismembered may be tied to other cases, including a torso found in a suitcase that washed up in the Long Island Sound in 2007. I think one of the things the police may be looking at, and they certainly should be looking at, is that Jessica Taylor uh, victimology, the idea that her head was found in one place, her torso found in another. Jordan says that case is probably separate from the first four sets of remains that were found, but she's not 100 percent sure about the number of killers. We don't know as much as the police know, so uh, that's why I've always got to have a hold back, that there could be information out there that would definitely change my opinion. But I personally believe that it is the work of more than one killer, most likely two not as many as three. If it is one killer, it is the sort of killer that we have never really seen before. But Dormer stands by his single killer theory today for several reasons. The FBI and the Justice Department figures out there's about a hundred serial killers in the United States overall at any one time. So the probability is that, you know, three or four of them are in Long Island, I think, again, is over the top. I don't think that that's probable. As for the fact that some remains were dismembered? The experts tell you that uh, serial killers evolve. They change. Now, there's a couple of theories with that. One is that they get a psychological thrill from dismembering somebody. It would also be that it makes it easier to dispose of them. If you cut the heads and the arms off and the legs, it's easier to transport. And the other thing is if you spread the body parts miles away from each other, it, uh, if the police find parts, they don't match up. They, they can't further their investigation. Maybe this killer decided, look, they never found any of the other remains. I don't have to dismember them anymore. Again, a theory based on past serial killer cases. In the more recent cases, investigators say the victims advertise their services on the Internet. It's all a part of doing business. These girls are very... Uh, um, ingenious and they're always looking for new ways to, to uh, use the internet. Detective Sergeant Brian Sweeney is with the Nassau County Police Department. Um, on the vice end, uh, we're constantly on the internet looking at different websites uh, for ads, for prostitution. Detective Sergeant Sweeney showed Fios One News how easy it is to find prostitution online. Craigslist has come under fire in recent years and closed one of its adult sections, but ads for prostitutes are still available on the site and easy to find. Here's a man for a woman, just one night. Looking for a little girl, and then he describes what he's looking for. Many of them have moved off of Craigslist onto the Backpage uh, website, uh, which does have an escort uh, section, and they're very blatant about their ads, um, oftentimes advertising their fees and uh, sometimes advertising their, or their uh, what they'll provide for the fees. Backpage is owned by the Village Voice and has recently been criticized by the New York City Council and other organizations for its ads. Here's an ad with a woman who's uh, dressed in uh, lingerie and she has $300 for an in-call service, $500 for an out-call service. He says investigators constantly look at the ads on these sites and others. I send undercovers in. Uh, we make arrests routinely. Um, after we make an arrest, we'll interview a uh, girl and we'll talk to her about whether she's been a victim of any other crimes. And there's an added part of their investigation since remains have been found at the beach. Knowing about the bodies they found out in Gilgo, we're constantly reminding girls about the, the dangers of prostitution industry and ask them if they have, in, have been with anybody that may have been suspicious or that may have created them to have a, a fear. And he warns. There's a safety issue for everybody involved because police and experts believe at least one killer is still walking free. Do I think it's anybody from within here? Absolutely not.
<clears throat> Let me ask you a question. If you were a murderer and you killed somebody, would you put them on your front lawn? Gus Coletti was one of the last people who saw Shannon Gilbert alive in the Homeowners Association development. He and many people wonder who the killer or killers might be who are responsible for the 10 sets of remains found along Ocean Parkway. In most of these cases, particularly looking at the, the lifestyles of the women, the person who is responsible for this is going to be a male, most likely in his 30s. But then again, if, if the crimes go back more than 10 years, he could easily be in his 40s by now. Very driven by issues of power and control, which we often see in serial killers. Some say the killer or killers had to be familiar with the Gilgo Beach area and law enforcement techniques and might be a clamor or a landscaper because of the way the first four bodies were found. This is somebody who we are quite certain did not just accidentally fall into this little stretch of beach. He either grew up there. If he doesn't live there right now, he's incredibly familiar with the area. Perhaps he summered there his entire life or spent many years there. The landscaper clamor theories go directly to the burlap sacks that those four women were found in. Criminologist Dr. Casey Jordan from Western Connecticut State University says the killer or killers probably blend into their communities. He's definitely still out there, and my guess is that he's definitely watching the news and following along with the investigation, and that by itself will shape his behavior. If police have gotten close to him, have interviewed him, have uh, talked about the, their profile of who it might be in a way that hits too close to home, this will definitely have a chilling effect on any activity. It doesn't mean he's going to desist from uh, soliciting women on Craigslist, but it means he'll desist from killing them to the extent that he can. If, however, he has genuine issues of power and control, if that's the overriding motivation for these murders, he may not be able to desist. He may lose his cool and lose his temper during an encounter and end up killing another woman. But if that's the case, you can be very sure that he's not going to try to bury the bodies out in the same location. Former Commissioner Dormer also worries that the perpetrator may still feel compelled to kill. That's a worry. That's a worry. Uh, you know, they do cool off. They can go mo weeks, months, they could go years between kills. But it depends on his psyche, if he needs that, if he needs that release. And he says the killer chose his victims, women who sometimes work alone and meet strangers alone. He's an organized killer. He's not taken many risks. The only risk he's taken is putting the remains in his car and driving to the dumping ground. Even in doing that, Dormer says, the killer worked to minimize risk. Well, the theory is that he pulled his vehicle up here uh, on the shoulder where we're standing right now and then carried the body in about 10, 15 yards, put the body down and came back, got in the vehicle and took off. It would only take, well, to pull the car in, I'd say about 30, 40 seconds, that quick. Dormer is still confident the killer will be caught. And uh, I've said this before, uh, that this guy has made a mistake and the, the job of the detectives is to find that mistake. Others are not as optimistic that police will succeed in tracking down the killer. I really doubt at this juncture that we will find the killer. I think that the age of the victims and the incredible um, scattered nature, the, the lack of a pattern and the lack of any DNA evidence because of the poor condition in which the remains were found, these things are almost always cleared by DNA evidence today. If they have no DNA evidence of a suspect, the only way this is going to be solved is perhaps if the killer attempts to kill another person, another woman, and she escapes. In the meantime, the relatives of victims are holding out for answers. A big part of me knows that um, Suffolk County Police, they are going to find more bodies before they find him. In April of this year, Melissa Can, the sister of Maureen Raynard Barnes, organized a motorcycle stunt fundraiser in Connecticut called Stunts for Justice. The event raised money for the Crime Stoppers reward for information on the murders. Both Lorraine and Melissa are optimistic a killer will be caught. I have full confidence in Suffolk County Police Department in their investigation on this case. Hopefully a year from now we'll be celebrating that they have caught the killer. Welcome back. You know, over the course of the past hour, we've heard many things, including how the search for a missing prostitute from New Jersey turned into so much more. We heard how that search led investigators to discover that Ocean Parkway, including the well-known Gilgo Beach area along the Atlantic Ocean, was nothing less than a dumping ground for bodies. We heard how multiple sets of human remains were found there. Also heard that some of them were dismembered 
and have yet to be identified, and some of the remains may be as much as a decade old. We also learned that the search for that missing prostitute became, in fact, a search for a serial killer. Now, as Holly Hare reported, one of the key elements in this case is that that 911 call Shannon Gilbert made on the night of her disappearance. Well, reports are conflicting about her demeanor during the call. Some say it was frantic. Others in law enforcement say she was calm. Now, we wanted to know. We requested the release of that 911 call under the Freedom of Information Act. And according to the response we received from the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office, quote, information pertaining to individuals who are subjects of an investigation but never prosecuted are not available, end quote. The letter does not specify who those individuals are, and a request for those tapes were denied as well. In the meantime, according to published reports, federal agents are increasingly frustrated by the Suffolk County Police Department's apparent unwillingness to accept the FBI's help in the stalled investigation, seemingly, according to many, going nowhere. Federal sources have been quoted as saying that the Suffolk PD does not want to lose control of this high-profile case. Now, we called Suffolk County Police several times for comment. A public information officer told us they were aware of those reports, but that no one was available to comment on the Gilgo Beach case. So as we wrap up our special report, Bodies at the Beach, Search for a Serial Killer, we take a look back at what some now are calling a sinister shore. We hear one more time from some of those whose lives have been forever changed by what has happened there. And finally, we ask you at home to take one more look at the victims, and we hope that in doing so, it might just jog a memory, provide a clue that might help law enforcement solve these gruesome crimes, and just perhaps maybe stopping a serial killer from killing again. So please, grab a pen or a pencil and you can contact a variety of organizations. I want you to take a look at them as we go forward. But before I do that, I want to thank you all for joining us. And I also want to thank Holly Hare as well for a terrific report. I'm Richard French, and thank you for joining us. It's not easy to cope, you know. First, you have to accept and um, accepting is going to be very hard for my family because there was that period of hoping. And no serial killer should go free.